Welcome back to chapter 4, the three-dimensional structure of proteins. In this lecture, which is part 5 of this chapter, we will examine a very important property of proteins. Protein folding. In living cells, proteins are assembled from amino acids and synthesized incrementally at the ribosome. For example, E. coli cells can make a complete biologically active protein molecule containing 100 amino acids in about 5 seconds at 37 degrees centigrade. However, the synthesis of peptide bonds on the ribosome is not enough. Now you may remember as to how proteins are translated, right? mRNA is get recognized by proteasome and it uses tRNA which has amino acids and also anticodons which matches the codons on uh, mRNA. And then it translates protein, the new polypeptide chain comes out. However, the polypeptide chain is not folded, right? So it requires to be folded. Proteins fold and adopt their native functional structures because of their primary, uh, primary sequence and the environment, including other proteins. This unfolded protein needs to fold and become a native folded conformation. Now, what we are going to look at is to how folding happens. The larger question is, how does a polypeptide chain arrive at its native conformation? Let us assume that in a polypeptide containing 100 amino acids, each amino acid residue could take up 10 different conformations on average. So, the number of conformations would be 10 to the power 100. This is the number of different conformations that a polypeptide could adopt. If each amino acid in a 100 amino acid chain could take up 10 different conformations. Now, let us also assume that the protein folds spontaneously by a random process in which it tries all possible conformations around every single bond. So what, what are we assuming here? That the protein folding is entirely random and it tries out all possible conformations around every single bond in its backbone until it finds its native conformation. When I mean by native conformation, it's the conformation that is folded. Now, if this were to happen, this would result in folding times of greater than 10 to the power 77 years for a 100 amino acid protein. So that is not true, right? Clearly, protein folding is not a completely random trial and error process. There must be shortcuts. The folding pathway of a large polypeptide chain is unquestionably complicated. There is no doubt about it. However, rapid progress has been made in this field. So much research is happening as we speak and there is sufficient uh, research that has already been done to provide robust algorithms that can often predict the structure of smaller proteins on the basis of their amino acid sequences. For example, if we consider this figure here, this shows a protein folding pathway as defined for a smaller protein. This is a smaller protein containing 56 amino acids. <coughs> 
Now, a hierarchical pathway is shown. This is based on computer modeling, as shown here. Small regions of secondary structures are assembled first. So small regions, for example, this region, this region, and this region, are assembled first. And then gradually incorporated into larger structures, right? This goes here, and this becomes a beta sheet. Whereas amino acids from 28 to 56, the first thing that they form is an alpha helix, and then the alpha helix becomes bigger, and then what forms is a motif, remember? The alpha, beta, alpha motif, right? Now this is an alpha beta motif because the alpha helix forms first and then a beta strand and another beta strand, right? Now another uh, secondary structural element forms in this way. The program used for this model uh, was slightly modified and it was highly successful in predicting the three-dimensional structure of small proteins from their amino acid sequence. So if you look at the numbers, the numbers indicate the amino acid in this 56 residue peptide that have acquired their final structure in each of the steps, which means that 8 to 15, 30 to 37, 45 to 52 were the first to start folding. And then it uh, incorporated other amino acids on either sides. So 41 to 56, 41 to 52, in this 41 to 56 happens to be the first to fold 28 to 56 and 30 to 37 in this peptide happen this this 30 to 37 which is the seven amino acid sequence happens to be the first to fold and they all fold at the same time and what happens at the end is when you have these folding and they fold into a larger protein which is 1 to 56 so individual secondary structural elements combine together to form the native structure. And this happens to be the native structure for this small protein. Protein folding is very fast. But how can proteins fold so fast? That's a very good question. Proteins fold to the lowest energy fold in the microsecond to second time scales. But the question is, how can they find the right fold so fast? How does it know as to what is the right fold? It is mathematically impossible for protein folding to occur by randomly trying every conformation until the lowest energy one is found. That is the Leventhal's paradox. Now, let me rephrase it. This means that mathematically, protein folding cannot happen randomly. So that's what it means. Search for the minimum is not random because the direction towards the native structure is thermodynamically most favorable. What this means is that protein folding is not random because the native structure that it is heading towards is indeed the most energetically favorable structure. And folding pathways will come into picture automatically that leads to this low energy structure. Two more points. Protein folding is hierarchical which means that certain amino acids prefer certain secondary structures. We have seen that, right? A classic example is some of the hydrophobic amino acids like leucine, isoleucine, and alanine prefers alpha helices, whereas certain secondary structures do not prefer alpha helices, such as glycine and proline, right? Proline is a helix breaker. So the ones that do prefer secondary structures, these secondary structures form first, then quickly interact. 
And then comes another structure called as molten globule. It's a structure where polypeptides collapse into a semi-folded state, burying hydrophobic residues. Molten global state has significant secondary structure, but is incomplete. Now, when, it mean, when I mean incomplete, it means that it is trying to form an alpha helix, but the alpha helix has not formed completely. That is what a molten globule is. Let me explain to you uh, this in a little more detail in the next slide. So here is an example. Now this figure is a little bit complicated. I'll try my best to simplify this. Now shown here is an energy well diagram, which means that the top of this energy diagram, it has the highest energy. As it goes down, the energy decreases. Now, here is the native structure. And shown on this side is the percentage of residues of protein in native conformation, which means that here is where 100% native structure is. As we go up, the percentage of native conformation decreases. Now, when a protein is unfolded, it has very high entropy. Reason? The number of conformations are very high. So higher number of conformations, higher conformational entropy. As a protein falls, entropy drops. Now remember, protein is folding in a system. So when protein falls, the entropy of the system increases, whereas the entropy of protein decreases. Now, the reason why delta G becomes negative is because protein is heading towards its native structure, which is the lowest energy conformation. And the entropy of the system increases. That leads to a decrease in change in free energy. So everything that happens that leads to native structure is a decreased free energy change. So at this point what happens is when a protein falls it can get stuck in semi-stable intermediate stages and one of them is a molten globule state. So as I said before, if you consider a helix uh, as a secondary structure that is being formed, a molten globule state is when a helix is partially formed. Now, for example, if there are 20 amino acid residues in that helix, only about 10 is formed. So it gets stuck in an energy well if it gets stuck in a molten globule, right? It is coming down and these are all energy wells. And, the, and the, the, the dip here is because it's a well. And this is the energy it requires to go up and come down. So these are two energy states. And that's what it means when, uh, uh, when the sentence says semi-stable intermediates can slow folding process because a molten globule state where alpha helix that has just 10 residues that is formed, it's trying to form all 20, uh, include all 20 amino acids in, um, in that 20 amino acid helix. But because it's getting, because it's stuck in this molten globule state, it's not able to do so faster. And so once it gets out of it, it can form the helix and then it can continue folding and reach its native structure. The native state as the lowest free energy. I hope I made this clear to you. Here is another example. The thermodynamics of protein folding can also be depicted as free energy funnels in three dimension. As protein folds, conformational space that can be explored by the structure is constrained. Now, this is modeled as a three-dimensional thermodynamic funnel as shown here. So there are 
four examples here. And in this model, delta G is represented by the depth of the funnel. The depth from here to here is the delta G. It's the energy. So the depth of the funnel is uh, essentially energy. And the native structure is N. This is very similar to the structure that I showed you. So it's very similar to the, the diagram that I showed you in the previous slide. The only difference is that the previous slide diagram was in two dimensions right in two dimensions and this is in three dimensions now the funnel for a given protein can have a variety of shapes like I said any folding intermediate with significant stability and finite lifetime would be represented as a local free energy minima a depression on the surface of the funnel any depression that you see here means that there are stable intermediates if you don't see any depression, that means there are no stable intermediates. And in the first case, this can have multiple folding pathways, can have various different folding pathways, but no stable intermediates because there is no energy wells. So intermediates cannot stuck, get stuck in them and they all lead to the native state. In the second case, there are multiple folding pathways many stable intermediates as you can see by these peaks here right and this represents folding intermediates with significant stability on multiple pathways c gives you a single stable native structure and no stable intermediates d on the other hand gives multiple folding pathways similar to A, but very stable intermediates. A protein with folding intermediates of substantial stability on virtually every pathway leading to the native structure. That is, a protein in which a particular motif, for example, or a domain always folds quickly. But other parts of the same protein fold slowly as compared to the first motif or the domain. So that is what this specific uh, structure represents. Some proteins undergo assisted folding. Chaperones are the proteins that help other proteins fold properly. Chaperones recognize partially folded proteins and bind to these proteins, thereby preventing complete unfolding. There are two kinds or two major families of chaperones that are very well studied. The first one is HSP70 or heat shock protein 70 family. The other one is chaperonins. HSP70 family has two functions. First, is it binds to protein regions that are hydrophobic. Remember that, thereby preventing inappropriate aggregation. The second function is that they block folding of proteins that need to be translocated across membranes. Now shown here is a figure uh, in which HSP70 is in action. Now this pathway uh, shows how HSP70 binds a partially unfolded or a non-folded protein. The unfolded or partially folded proteins bind first to the open ATP bound form of HSP70. ATP bound form of HSP70 is then then interacts with HSP40, which forms a complex and triggers ATP hydrolysis. Remember, wherever you see ATP and ATP hydrolysis, this means that a process that requires energy is being carried out because ATP is an energy-rich molecule. Now, once ATP is hydrolyzed to ADP and phosphate, a conformational change happens. And the domains colored orange and yellow 
come closer and form a part of a jaw that traps the unfolded proteins inside and it protects this part and this part has hydrophobic residues and that's what interacting with this jaw-like structure. Dissociation of ADP and recycling of the HSP70 requires interaction with another protein. So there's a cycle that happens here. And this way, HSP70 protects unfolded, part unfolded or partially folded proteins. Chaperonins, the second family of chaperones, are elaborate protein complexes that are required for the folding of some cellular proteins that do not fold spontaneously. These elaborate protein complexes use ATP energy to sequester and constrain a protein. In E. coli, an estimated 10 to 15 percent of cellular proteins require the resident chaperonin system called as GROW-EL or GROW-ES for folding under normal conditions. This figure shows a proposed pathway for the action of E. coli chaperonins, GROW-EL and GROW-ES. Each GROW-EL complex consists of two large chambers formed by two heptameric rings, which means there are seven subunits, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Two heptameric rings, Grow ES that is shown as yellow is also a heptamer and it blocks one end of Grow EL chambers after an unfolded protein is bound inside. So every time Grow ES blocks Grow EL, an unfolded protein is bound. And every time Grow ES gets out of here, the protein folds and goes out. That's the whole process. Now, the way the process is done is uh, that these chambers with the seven heptameric rings gets bound by ATP. When ATP binds to each subunit of the grow EL heptamer, what you have is uh, that is when an unfolded protein binds to this specific uh, part of grow EL. ATP hydrolysis leads to release of 7 phosphate, 7 ADP from this part of the grow EL chamber and 7 ADP from the bottom part because grow ES from the bottom part has released. Then 7 ATP another 7 ATP molecule and grow ES binds to grow EL with a filled packet where your unfolded protein is bound. As soon as grow ES binds, ATP hydrolysis happens and another 7 ATP gets bound to the lower chamber. The upper chamber now has grow ES and the unfolded protein that is inside grow EL. Now this is where the protein folds with the help of grow ES. Grow ES gets released. 7 ADP molecules gets released with phosphate and folded protein gets released. And the released protein is fully folded or in a partially folded state that is committed to adopt the native conformation. And this is how Grow EL, Grow ES system works. What I want you to take away from this complicated slide is uh, two things. One is that protein folding by Grow EL, Grow ES is a complicated thing. And Grow EL, Grow ES uh, functions on E. coli. In addition to these two things, I also want you to understand that 
chaper grow el grow es is an example of chaperonins and it uses atp uh, while doing its function finally the folding pathways of some proteins require two enzymes that catalyze isomerization reactions. The first one is PDI, or protein disulfide isomerase. It's a widely distributed enzyme that catalyzes the interchange or shuffling of disulfide bonds until the bonds of the native conformation are formed. The second one is peptide prolyl cis-trans isomerase, or PPI. This catalyzes isomerization of proline peptide bonds from trans to cis. Remember, cis prolines are found in beta turns. So from trans to cis conversion, PPI is the enzyme that assists. Proteins can also unfold. Loss of protein structure inevitably leads to loss of function. Proteins can unfold by a number of mechanisms. And these are the different conditions in which proteins can unfold in a test tube. For example, changes in pH, addition of organic solvents, addition of solutes, detergents, or changes in temperature. These can, all these conditions can unfold a folded protein. In addition, improperly fold, folded proteins can have negative health consequences. This is in our body. A typical example is in the case of formation of disease causing amyloid fibrils. Protein molecules whose normal structure includes regions of beta sheets undergo partial folding or misfolding. In a small number of the molecules, before folding is complete, the beta sheet regions of one polypeptide can associate with the same region in another polypeptide, something like this. Now, this is detrimental because this can lead to what is called as beta amyloid fibrils. What is shown here is when the amyloid beta peptide begins as a two alpha helical segments of a large proteins. Now, if it undergoes proteolytic cleavage of a large protein, this leaves a relatively unstable amyloid beta peptide, which loses its helical structure. And it can slowly assemble into fibrils, which contribute to the characteristic plaques or the exterior uh, uh, plaque-like structures on nervous tissue in people with Alzheimer's disease. And this is a very well characterized phenomenon now, as I said, protein unfolding is very common. And when we say protein unfolding, we will base it on laboratory unfolding of a protein. Denaturation is another word for protein unfolding. Denaturing a protein using mild agents results in an unfolding curve. I'll show you as to how a protein folding and unfolding curve looks like. Unfolding occurs over a narrow range of denaturant. Denaturant can be anything that I told you before in the previous slide, right? pH, temperature, detergents, organic solvents, or solutes. Unfolding is usually a cooperative process. When a few bonds break, it weakens the rest. And if an experiment proved that protein sequence contain the information needed to produce the native form, which means that if you unfold a protein and fold it back, it'll fold back to its native lowest energy conformation. So what is 
and Finson experiment. And Finson experiment was conducted on a protein called ribonuclease A and it was shown that protein refolding is not random. Just like protein unfolding, protein can also be refolded. So how does this experiment work? Ribonuclease A in its native state is catalytically active. It is an enzyme. Now it's a nuclease and it's a ribonuclease, which means it cleaves nucleotides in RNA. And that's the catalytic function. Now, the, uh, the experiment uses urea and uh, BME or uh, mercaptoethanol. Urea disrupts stabilizing hydrogen bonds and beta mercaptoethanol reduces disulfide bonds. This is, our, this is a, a structure of BME. And when you unfold it, you have SH that is free because it's not in disulfide conformation anymore, right? Unfolded state. It so happens that there are eight cysteine residues in this enzyme that could reform in up to 105 different combinations. What does that mean? Which means that uh, the disulfide bonds are formed, there are four disulfide bonds in a native structure and when you unfold it, you get eight cysteines. And these can form disulfides with any of these, right? This cysteine can form disulfide with this, or this, or this, or this. And this can form with this, or this, or this, or this. That's what it means by 105 different combinations. But when they refolded this protein, by removal of urea and mercaptoethanol, the native form was catalytically active and they proved that the refolding is not random and it follows a specific path to its lowest energy native conformation. And only then ribonuclease A can be catalytically active once it gets refolded. So this is the experiment. There are so many things here that you need to understand. BME or DTT, both are reducing agents. They reduce disulfide bonds. Urea can disrupt hydrogen bonds and denature. And you can also renature when you remove the reductant, the reducing agent, and also urea. So what is refolding? After unfolding a protein, removal of the denaturant agent will sometimes allow the protein to refold. Sometimes is being capitalized. Just to emphasize the point that not all proteins refold. A properly refolded proteins will have structure, function, and all proper disulfide bonds. The Anifson experiment, sorry, the Anfinson experiment showed that ribonuclease A could be refolded and refolding was not random. So this means that refolding, not all proteins can be refolded and all those proteins that gets refolded, they come back to their native state. Thermal denaturation of two different proteins are shown here. One is ribonuclease A and the other one is apomyoglobin. The midpoint of the temperature range over which denaturation occurs is called as the melting temperature or TM. Denaturation of apomyoglobin was monitored by circular dichroism whereas denaturation of ribonuclease A was tracked by monitoring changes in the intrinsic fluorescence of the protein. Remember, uh, if you have tryptophans in your protein, your protein can fluoresce. And intrinsic fluorescence of a protein can be obtained by changes 
in the conformation of tryptophans in the protein. So if a protein unfolds, the local environment around tryptophan changes and it fluoresces and hence intrinsic fluorescence. So a def uh, for an unfolded protein, you can see the difference. And the curve clearly shows that ribonuclease A is slightly less stable as compared to apomyoglobin, which unfolds at a higher temperature as compared to ribonuclease A. On the right is uh, a plot of percent unfolded versus concentration of guanidine hydrochloride. Guanidine hydrochloride is a denaturant. As we increase the concentration of uh, guanidine hydrochloride, you increase the unfolding of ribonuclease A. Mutations in a protein can affect protein stability. As I said, the curve indicates that the protein is getting unfolded. Right? Now, two different scenarios. HMGB is the wild type protein. And here is the curve for the denaturation of a wild type protein as we increase the concentration of denaturant. And the y axis is the fraction unfolded, right? One means 100% folded, 100% unfolded. Now, if you mutate a specific residue, cysteine to alanine, what happens is its uh, stability decreases. So it can get unfolded at even a lower concentration of unfold, uh, the denaturant. But if you mutate a residue glycine 46 to alanine, you see that its unfolding curve shifts to right. Right? Cysteine 22, that shifts to the left. Glycine 46 to alanine shifts to right. This means that the new mutant protein has increased stability. As you increase the concentration of denaturant, unfolding happens at a higher concentration as compared to wild type. We come to the end of this chapter. Let us summarize. In this chapter, we learned a lot of things. These are some of the important things. We learned about two most important secondary structures, alpha helices and beta sheets. We learned about beta turns as well, but we did not extend our discussion on beta turns. We also learned as to how properties and function of fibrous proteins are related. How to determine three-dimensional structures of proteins. And one of the largest unsolved puzzles in modern biochemistry as to how proteins fold. And this specifically has to deal with globular proteins.